Okay, uh, these are all the announcements. I would like to introduce uh, Norman Casagrande from DeepMind, who will talk about WaveNet, what is behind Google's voice. Hello, everybody, and welcome to my presentation. Uh, I would like to start with a little bit of a teaser, all right? So this is a um, recording. Well, I'll play it first, and so you'd be the judge. This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. I'll play it again, just because it didn't get the first part. But... This is boring, Dudley moaned. He shuffled away. Harry moved in front of the tank and looked intently at the snake. So this is a voice which has been entirely generated by a computer. There was no recording of a person saying that sentence. There was no even parts of that recording that were uh, stitched together you know, to generate that part. This is really uh, entirely generated the voice by technique called deep learning. We're gonna have a look at what's behind this technology and what drives it. Okay, well, first of all, a little bit of a history of speech synthesis. Well, it has a long, long history. Actually, we can go back to Middle age, uh, Ages, where uh, people built uh, these uh, brazen heads, uh, which uh, uh, had uh, some sort. Of, we're making some sort of la uh, sound that um, reminded the human speech. Uh, and uh, in this uh, picture, it's basically showing uh, how it could be used to actually scare people. Uh, but uh, the desire for generating machines that uh, uh, can uh, mimic uh, the voice of human beings actually goes a long way, way back. Uh, in the 20th century, we started using a little bit more advanced technology. Uh, this is a schema for what it was called a border, so, uh, sort of like a piano-like instrument uh, which could uh, uh, be used to generate uh, some sort of like spoken audio. Uh, but it was mildly intelligible, but it wasn't really uh, that much useful at the time except entertaining people and making feel like uh, this machine was like spookingly generating uh, audio. Uh, more recently, we had uh, uh, voices uh, which became very pop very famous, like the one that uh, Hawking uh, uh, used back uh, in uh, well until his death. Um, now, m more from a um, software perspective, uh, traditionally uh, techniques from a software um, point of view have been using two different approaches. Uh, mainly, at least. Uh, one was called unit selection, and basically the idea is that you have somebody sitting in a studio recording uh, uh, a long, long, long list of sentences. It can be very boring. It, uh, we're talking about like uh, tens and tens of hours, all the way up to 100 or 200 hours. And then uh, you uh, take a software, you slice those um, recordings uh, into bits, uh, and you try to stitch them together. Um, it does sound natural, especially for the parts that were uh, part of the original recording, uh, but if, you would, if you're trying to say something that it's not part of the original data, database, it might sound a little bit glitchy. I have an example here. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth and edible flesh, and a large stone. So you can already hear um, that uh, in the parts where it's trying to say something like a word, it sounds good, uh, but in between the words, uh, or sometimes in between uh, you know, parts of a word that was not part of the database, uh, it sounds really, really bad. Uh, an alternative, uh, which was also quite popular, uh, was called parametric. So the idea is that you would uh, um, try and simulate uh, the vocal tract of human beings, uh, uh, with a formula, essentially. And, uh, and then you would use a set of parameters uh, where you manipulate uh, this formula and you generate audio. Um, and uh, you can also uh, try to adapt those parameters based on uh, speech uh, that you have uh, recorded it on, uh, that for which you have recordings. Uh, now, this works, uh, you know, when you want to generate pretty much anything, um, but it sounds quite unnatural. I have another example here. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. It might not sound too bad, but I assure you that if you try with a uh, headphones, it will sound really, really bad. 
Um, and in particular, if you don't have a lot of recordings for the parametric system, uh, it doesn't sound good at all. Um, and only recently, uh, deep learning has come, uh, uh, you know, prominently as a technique uh, to actually take the best of, uh, to a certain extent, the best of the world world. Because we take, we learn a system end to end uh, to manipulate, to generate the audio uh, from the samples themselves. And this is a, an example of the same sentence generated with WaveNet. And we're going to look at what WaveNet uh, is. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. Avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leather. Uh, what? Okay. I just wanted to make another, you know, listen so that you can feel the difference. Parametric. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. All right. Then the next one. The avocado is a pear-shaped fruit with leathery skin, smooth edible flesh, and a large stone. So it's way more natural. Now. Um, what is WaveNet? Well, um, the definition, the actual definition of WaveNet, <laughs> it's an autoregressive neural network with dilated convolution, which can be summarized into magic, um, <laughs> which is basically what deep learning <laughs> is uh, most of the time. Um, I try to, you know, keep the memes uh, at the minimum. But anyway, this is EMF, uh, and so we want to dive in, uh, you know, open the hood and look at what exactly these other aggressive neural networks with dilated convolution means. So, first of all, the neural network part. Now, I'm not going to go too much into details about what, neural, what a neural network is, uh, because um, I only have half an hour, and there is lots and lots and lots of really good uh, tutorials out in the web. But... Um, in a nutshell, you, had a bunch of, you have a bunch of inputs. Ooh, let me take a pointer here. So you have a bunch of inputs, right? You make and go through some what we call the hidden layers, which basically is you take the input, you multiply it with a bunch of matrices, which are your parameters that you need to adjust, okay? You apply some linearities, you pass it to the next level, blah, 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 and then you go all the way up to the top. And then this top, uh, it's what you're trying to predict, okay? And basically, depending on how well your prediction is, uh, you adjust uh, your weights, uh, which were these hidden, uh, hidden parts here, uh, to make sure that the next time you run with the same example, you're actually closer to the output there. Now, uh, what are those outputs uh, for WaveNet? Well, those outputs are the samples. This is really part of what made uh, WaveNet so revolutionary. We're trying to model the samples themselves. And the samples are those values, okay, um, that exist in the, that um, form the representation of the audio, which is this waveform. I have this animation here that shows how we have for, you know, a good quality audio, about 24,000 of them per second. So you need a model that is able to predict 24,000 of those tiny little samples per second in a way that make it sound natural with respect to the audio. So, how does it work? Well, the neural network, we've seen, you know, the neural network parts. Well, next bit, it's the autoregressive part. Because um, we are actually proceeding one sample at a time. Uh, we start with uh, the one at the very beginning here at the bottom, uh, which, uh, you know, when you actually, when you're training, you have the ground truth, okay, usually, so the original audio. Uh, when you're not training, you might want to start with uh, random or uh, zeros, depending on your thing. Anyway, uh, you make it go through the uh, these hidden layers, multiplication, blah, 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 uh, and so forth, and then you got the output. Now, as you remember, uh, I say that, you know, then in, you, in neural networks, you have the backpropagation stage where you adjust the weights here. But anyway, long story short, you get a number at the end, which is your sample at that time step. Well, then you pick up that sample at that time step, and you use it as the next input. And then again, you go through the uh, network, which by the way is the same, okay? Just to be clear, in this case, those two samples are different, but they, the network in the middle is the same, right? So you readjust those things a little bit and so forth. So you, you repeat, you repeat, you repeat, and then you end up having uh, a lot of those samples that are generated. Now, last part, oh, well, and obviously you got a lot of them. Now the problem is that you have a lot of them. Right. Previously, I was showing you there's like 24,000 of them per second. And generally, when you want to say something, it's more than, 20, than a second. It's, I don't know, five seconds or something like that. So um, 
an, an additional critical uh, contribution by WaveNet uh, uh, is this concept of a dilated convolution. So instead of just taking, picking up um, the uh, output of, you know, well, your input, you stick it into the hidden layer, and then it goes all the way up to the end in a linear fashion, you actually pick up uh, um, also the one that comes before, at least for the first layer. And then for the layer above, uh, you have like this concept of dilation, which means that it picks up uh, uh, the output of the previous layer uh, which was in, in, a, in a way that it's a factor of uh, um, the timestamp. So in the case of here, it's a factor of two, and then here is a factor of four, and then a factor of uh, eight, and so forth. Which means that uh, because of those hidden layers are to a certain extent representing a summary of the state of the knowledge at that point, uh, these sample, the one that you're generating at the end, it's actually encapsulating the knowledge that goes not just from the step before, but it goes all the way back to uh, you know, a power of two, depending on the number of layers that you have in between. Okay, and uh, you go. in summary, uh, you got like this fancy animation uh, which uh, was generated, that uh, was created uh, when the blog post about WaveNet came out and shows the whole process. And you see here, you start with the input, it goes out, uh, it generates the output, uh, use it again, and then so forth and so forth and so forth. Now, thing is that until now, we've been talking about samples, right? Um, and in particular, I uh, hinted at the fact that at the very, I mean, so when you don't train and you actually wanna generate audio, you might start at the very beginning with silence or, or uh, a random number. If you trained on a lot of audio, of spoken audio, what will happen is that the network will learn to say something, okay, but just anything, okay, nothing in particular, something that kind of sound like voice, but doesn't mean anything. And I have a bunch of examples here that are quite eerie. Um, Sudden. It was better to say, yeah, we are still zoom out, but I don't know if it's in the teacher, I don't know if it's in the technical community at all. I'm pretty, I'm pretty. So this is, this is a wave net that has been trained on tons and tons of, of spoken audio, all right? And then you have a random number at the very beginning and you run it through and you just tell him, tell it to uh, generate uh, samples of a sample, of a sample, of a sample, and you get something that sounds like Swedish. Um, I just even, that was this, this there's lots of work for Caden to be telling me. another example. Well, name, could I, do you feel very, it's very, 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 it's gibberish, but it's it's gibberish that it's uh, very much uh, believable uh, with respect to what a human being would say, uh, or you know the way uh, a human being would pronounce stuff. So, how do we tell WaveNet what to say? Well, I just even oh, not this. this. I don't want you to say that. <laughs> All right. Well, there is this other part uh, which we call the conditioning stack. Okay. Uh, in this condition is that, well, you know, you have uh, at the very beginning what we call these linguistic features, um, and we stick those as the inputs, okay, to, to the network. Um, and uh, at the beginning, so these linguistic features are usually things like phonemes, uh, um, intonation, so we want to tell the network, look, here you have to put a stress, uh, we have punctuation, question marks, uh, points, uh, where you, so the network learns that when it says dot, uh, it means uh, that it has to break for a moment, and so forth. And importantly, every language obviously uh, has its own. For that matter, every voice has its own. I mean, I uh, would challenge anybody to try and replicate what David Attenborough is doing. It has like its own unique way of saying things, right? So um, you need a set of those linguistic features that uh, you wanna match for a specific speaker, and for, for a specific language. Now, this at the beginning, uh, so you have an input, uh, anybody knows uh, anything about neural network uh, will understand that this is not as easy as the previous example that we saw because for a sample you have a number. In this case we have phonemes, so you have to map those phonemes uh, in a sort of way. Uh, but long story short, um, there is all sorts of you know, deep learning technique. Uh, if you want, uh, we can discuss this later, uh, those things later on. But anyway, they get mapped into neural network stuff. Okay, and then uh, they squeeze, squeeze, then rearrange, et cetera, et cetera, so that they can match into these, uh, into the existing uh, hidden layers. They're literally added to the hidden layers. So you can imagine that um, at this stage here, okay, this mishmash of linguistic features uh, end up being a vector of numbers, 
they then get summed to uh, the vector that represent, it's represented uh, by those weights. And they represent those weights. And this is, you know, the wave of magic. Um, and it's really, really cool. It actually made a huge splash. Uh, nobody really was, ho was waiting for something like that. Now the problem, oh, yes, and the results uh, speak for themselves. I think we already had a bunch of examples. Maybe I'll play just one more to give you a um, you know, sense. So this is a before. single wave net can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. So this is unit selection, stitching things together, stitching things together. This is wave net. A single wave net can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. All right, and then a parametric version. A single wave net can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. A single wave net can capture the characteristics of many different speakers with equal fidelity. All right. Now, this was all well and good in 2016. However, it was unfortunately a little bit slow. Uh, something I didn't mention is the fact that this process of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, through a lot of those hidden layers which were holding, I, I mean, I briefly skimmed on the fact that uh, you got ma matrix multiplication, but there were a lot of those matrix multiplication. So it was great, but it was really, really, really slow. However, people recognized it was extremely an extremely exciting piece of technology. So it was like a huge push for making it, um, you know, real time so that we could use it to power Google Assistant and Google Home. So in 2017, uh, we came out with a, uh, um, a different piece of technology which uh, was sitting on top of WaveNet. And just to give you an example, the original WaveNet, so this is um, uh, showing you how much time it was taking to generate 0.02 seconds of audio. It was taking about a second, okay? So bear that in mind for, for a moment. Right. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> um, uh, like uh, late Augusta, where Apple said it's really cool technology, it's not feasible, and then we launched it uh, like a couple of months later, which was uh, just pretty, pretty sweet, <laughs> if you ask me. So anyway, how does it work? Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to go into details because we're gonna also talk about version three, but in a nutshell, so remember, this is the autoregressive part, huh? Well, basically, we, um, there is a technique in machine learning that is called distillation. And it's kind of like magical to a certain extent because um, it means that you first train this model on a bunch of data, okay? And then you have like this model, which is okay, it's pretty good, but it's really, really slow. And, but you can, what you can do is that you pick up like another model that trained on the output of the first model. In a way, it's kind of like, you know, uh, two computers talking to each other, uh, and one teaching him, oh, you should do this, uh, you should do that, uh, without any oversight from human beings, uh, or you know, additional data, right? Uh, and so this is what the feedforward model is about. Uh, funny thing is that, so the actual uh, feedforward model starts with noise, okay? It goes through, uh, well, a bunch of dilation layers, et cetera, et cetera, and then it outputs, uh, the result in one go, instead of going through this back and forth model. Yes, like I said, I, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time to discuss this. Um, it's quite interesting, there is a bunch of papers, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, more interesting, I think, oh well, first of all, uh, where it used to take one second to generate uh, the 0 0.02 seconds of data, now this thing can produce 20 seconds of data in just one second. So it was really, really, really fast. Um, and this was 2017, and this is actually what currently is in production uh, within Google. Um, the only problem with it is that it takes about, uh, it's a bit complicated because it takes uh, some time to train the first model, the one they teach, uh, and you have to train it with a lot of data on the speaker, and then you have to, to take the other model, and then uh, this, this uh, student model has to train on the teacher model. So it's kind of like a complicated process, right? So um, in 2018, uh, we further advanced the research. Um, so you see it's slow, complicated, and make it even faster. Uh, and so remember, this was the original um, schema of WaveNet, right? Well, this part is gone, right? And it has been replaced by, uh, well, instead of this bit, uh, this bit, um, which is a GRU cell. Now, 
Bear with me for a second. I, we're not going to go too much into detail about this thing. Just so, should you, so, just so that you know, this is a um, quite common technique uh, in machine learning for recurrent uh, processes where you have sequences, okay? Um, but um, yeah, just to give you an idea, the input goes here, goes through a bunch of stuff, uh, mathematical operations uh, to basically decide what to remember, what not to remember, etc. And then it goes out there. Uh, and there is also a bunch of stuff that goes into um, the connection between those, those cells uh, so they can talk to each other. Uh, but the, the beauty about this new system is that it uses way less parameter in this area. Uh, it can talk to each other like in between uh, uh, the, um, the, the timestamps. Uh, it doesn't need dilation. Uh, not in this bit, at least. Uh, and uh, it, oh, yeah, and by the way, the conditioning goes somewhere here. Uh, this is very scientific notation, by the way. Um, yeah, and it's a very compact model. And above that, it can also be sparsified. Uh, that's also another technique. Um, not go, I won't go too much into details because this is really a Pandora's box. And I could talk for hours uh, about that. But um, uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, the idea is that um, these parameters that the model is adjusting during the training process, there's just a bunch of values, right? Uh, they're called weights, okay? And um, not all of them are really that important for the actual process of generating, uh, you know, the output that we care about. And uh, if you, during training, uh, you could decide to say, okay, look, the, those weights that are not that high, that are not really contributing too much to the results, just zero, zero, zero them out. Right, and then you go on for a while training, and then uh, you get another bunch uh, of uh, weights that are also kind of tiny, and you say, ah, oh, yeah, I don't care too much about those. And the model, why, because this is a training process, the model has to cope with that kind of situation. And eventually, uh, you end up having a model that is extremely specified. Most of the weights are zeros, okay, which means that after you train the model, you can just ignore those zeros because they don't contribute to the process. To the point in which you can even run this thing on a device, uh, on a device like, uh, like a phone. Okay, now, what about the future? Well, we want to make it even faster, obviously. We've got a bunch of ideas. Uh, I cannot go too much into details. Uh, but I think that even more important than that, it's make it train faster. Um, it is true that this second, mo uh, third model that I was talking about doesn't need uh, the teacher-student approach, uh, so you can train it in one go and then deploy the thing as it is, but it still needs a lot of data. Um, however, there's like different techniques uh, that we are uh, looking into to, um, you know, just learn based, instead of using tens of hours or hundreds of hours of recording, we can maybe train it in 10 minutes or something like that. Um, and bring it to the whole world. Because right now, since uh, we're kind of like data constrained, um, the assistant is only available in English, uh, German, French, uh, Japanese, and a bunch of other languages. But we really would like to bring it to, to the entire world and to all different types of uh, languages. Uh, we also have a bunch of uh, different uh, ideas for architectures. We have EMF, I'm pretty sure it would be really cool. But I think that more important than that is that you could use this technology uh, to order things outside of text-to-speech. Uh, because WaveNet can replicate signals really well. And I have an example here. This is WaveNet trained on music rather than sound, than, than voice. And this is, whoops, and this is what it generates. Now, this is, this is like the babbling that we were hearing before, right? There's no conditioning. We're not telling WaveNet uh, play, I don't know, specific sets of notes. We just say, tell WaveNet, look, you train on, on, on music, now figure something out. You start with random, and this is what it generates. And there's another one example. I think it's really cool. I don't know if you. Anyway, that's the end of my um, presentation. Oops. If you have any question, uh, do we have time for questions? Ah. Well.
Thanks. <laughs>